was a real food paradise. This still is one of the best examples of how humans can thrive with nature. It's all right there. It's still right there. This is the black gold of Xochimilco. This is like some of the best soil I've ever held in my life. It's amazing that that exists in the heart of Mexico City. We are here in Mexico City to see an ancient agricultural system that is still productive today. And we're here to see, is this the most productive agricultural system in history? And what can we learn from this system to help us face the great challenges that we face in this day? The basin of Mexico City is located at a high elevation in the south of the country. The basin used to be covered by five lakes, and it was on an island in one of these lakes that the Aztecs built their legendary capital city, Tenochtitlan. Even before the Aztecs, agriculture had taken a unique form here. In order to grow food in this flooded landscape, an innovative form of agriculture was developed, where land was recovered for farming by building artificial islands and peninsulas that are known as the Chinampas. These Chinampas covered the lakes and provided food for the capital city in a maze of canals and raised gardens. When the Spanish conquered Tenochtitlan in 1521, they began to systematically destroy the city and the intricate waterworks that included the Chinampas. Mexico City grew over the ruins of Tenochtitlan and has steadily expanded over the last 500 years, draining and covering the lakes and paving over the Chinampas that once covered the wet valley. This vast ancient farming system has been all but erased from history except for one special area. So these are the Chinampas, also known as the floating gardens of Xochimilco, and they're still in use 500 years after the fall of the Aztec Empire. So why do we think this could be the most fertile agricultural system in history? It was a real food paradise, no? because you plant on land, you can fish, and then you can hunt. This man-made intervention created more biodiversity so that everyone thrived together. I mean, I have a friend from here that says we have thousand-year reservoir of nutrients and, and minerals. We've got here about 11% of organic matter. Wow. This is the, the black gold of Xochimilco. That's the color you want. This is like some of the best soil I've ever held in my life, right? I mean, this is like the, the foundation of the Chinampas right here. Yeah, this is all man-made. The origin of this soil is the sediments that we have on the bottom of the lake, mixed with plants, with roots, with trees, so that it becomes not only black, but it has the right texture. You don't need to water these this plants. You can just put the seeds in and then you cut these blocks and you don't water it for a month. It's just like a giant sponge. Yeah. And as long as we keep it covered, then it will, it will stay that way. Because Mexico City is a giant basin, there's no outlet for all the sediment that washes down from the mountains. This has gone on for millennia, and so all of the soil and debris from this large mountain range settled into the lakes, providing extremely fertile materials for constructing the Chinampas. Because of this geography, there's a deep and long-lasting reservoir of fertility that formed the basis of food production for ancient civilizations. This is a very shallow lake, and because it's so shallow, it was easy enough to pull mud out of the canal and to put it in this rectangle. The chinampas were constructed by creating a perimeter of willow stakes known as aguajotes that were anchored to the bottom of the lake. Reeds were then woven around the framework of the stakes to create a container enclosed on four sides. 
Into this container was placed brush, aquatic plants, weeds, and whatever else was available, making a big sponge of organic material. Then using buckets or long shovels, the lake mud was scooped out and placed in a layer over the organic material. More organic material and more mud could be added as needed to get the chinampa to the desired height. Over time, the organic material broke down and the whole mass became a body of soil that could then be planted. The awajote willow stakes would then sprout and grow roots to shore up the perimeter of the chinampa, and more trees were planted as needed. The chinampa became stable and many crops could be continually planted. This chinampa in particular is the one that looks like how it was originally designed. It resembles the most the original design. So we can picture that this chinampa could be worked by one person. I am sure that the chinampa in its origin is an agroforestry system, always surrounded by trees. As we say, this is an agriculture based more on process than on inputs. The original design of the chinampa, the chinampa is always surrounded by water and we have all these trees, the, the willows that are called awejotes. They help to keep the chinampa in place. If you dig one meter and a half, you will find the lake. For trees, it's, it's a very good idea. They can easily reach down a meter and a half and then get the water from there. That way it's also like pumping water to the system, no? because most of the content of this leaf is water and once we put it down, it's like a way of irrigating by covering. That's a really cool image. So the trees are actually pumping this water into their leaves and organic matter, which you then add to the soil, which then with the increased organic matter in the soil, you actually have better water retention and you have to do less irrigation. Exactly, yeah, yeah trees are harvesting water for us and uh, the sunlight and then we have different sizes of canals, primary, secondary, and tertiary. The traditional chinampas are configured as long rectangles surrounded by water and were not built over 12 meters or 40 feet wide. So all sides of the chinampa had easy access to water for irrigation and boat transport of crops, soil, and organic matter. It is also really important for chinampas to be surrounded by water because during the rainy season, all the salt that is naturally in the soil can run off. Some people, in order to have more land, they have filled up canals and, and cut down trees, but knowingly or without knowing, they are disrupting the, the original design that, in my opinion, it's, it's perfect. There are three canal types. The primary canals, which are big enough for small barges for transporting lake mud and crop residues. The secondary canals are sized for canoes. And then the tertiary canals are just small channels big enough to irrigate from, but too small for boats. We are using those smaller canals to start to reintroduce all those endemic species here. Well, the most emblematic species is the, the Ashwalotl. It's like a salamander, it's an amphibian. Ashwalotls, as biologists say, they are bioindicators, you know, that the ecosystem is healthy. Right. You have to have all the, like, all the food chain. The tertiary canals are important to preserving the native ecosystem and creating habitat for the endangered ashwalotl salamanders, as well as other aquatic species that are threatened by the introduced tilapia and carp. The tertiary canals are also where they're pulling out water for irrigation, so there's concern about the water purity. Their strategy has been the construction of biofilters at the ends of these tertiary canals. The biofilters make it so the water needs to filter through a barrier of gravel that's planted with reeds known for their water filtering qualities. The tertiary canals then become miniature bioreserves where the salamanders, frogs, and crustaceans can be protected from the tilapia. The ashalotls are particularly threatened and are considered a very special species, both in their role in Aztec religion as a form of one of their gods and their capacity to regenerate almost any part of their body. They've been extensively studied in medical research, so the loss of ashalotl genetic diversity is not only a loss of biology and culture, but of science as well. 
for these reasons, the axolotl is the totem species of the chinampas, and the success of Lucio's project and the health of the chinampas can be judged by the proliferation of the axolotl salamander. The chinampas, now we have 2,200 hectares of chinampas, when we used to have more than, than 100,000. Since the Spanish conquest, the water management is basically a, a history of bad decisions. The Aztecs were experts in, in water management, in, in knowing how to control the levels of each lake. The Spaniards, really what they did was start to divert canals, dry the lakes, dry the, the rivers, basically destroying the, the water system. We used to have five great lakes, and, and now we have water problems, no? As the city grew, the water bodies shrank. Water treatment plants now supply all the water to the lake. The quality of the treatment plants, it's, it's more than good enough for, for irrigation. The problem in Xochimilco is more 300 hectares have been urbanized, and they don't have a, a sewage system. So all that water goes into the chinampas and mostly the pathogens are of concern. The water also from the Xochimilco aquifer is being used at a faster rate than it's been recovered. So now with the water issues and the pollution of the people that have started living in the chinampas are really endangering the, the system. So these chinampas are a living thread that weaves together past and present. This whole thing was a giant lake bed. These chinampas were created and then the city paved it all over. And here we are in the final vestiges, the last part of this magnificent, massive system that is still intact to this day. Arca Tierra is a project that links farmers with people in the city uh, by means of agriculture. And then we also have rural tourism, especially in Xochimilco, where we invite people to go to the Chinampas. For us, it's really supporting a network of good farming and a, a better food system. Arca Tierra has made enormous progress in having the cultural and biological value of the Chinampas recognized. They're applying permaculture and ecological design principles to an ancient system with modern problems and are gaining real momentum. What we would like to promote is farming as a way of regeneration, of landscape, of food, of culture, of, of social relations, and also to try to rehabilitate the water systems that, that used to be in Mexico City, taking ancient knowledge from the people that understood this environment very well, and also backing all that information with, with scientific knowledge, with researchers from universities. It's not only for farming. We can hear all the birds, there are amphibians, crustaceans. There's many different animals and plants that live here. And if we go towards an agroforestry system, there's gonna be more life. And we're gonna sequester more carbon, and it's gonna be more beautiful. So the challenge is to make it profitable, very productive, and that more people can, can join. So what do we have to learn from this system that can be applied elsewhere? This is a pattern that can be replicated in any wet, swampy area. Lower the low areas for deep water and raise islands for cultivation. We can create more production and diversity on these wet sites. This is a resilient strategy that has withstood the test of time. And we are standing here on living proof of that. People say that this is you know, the most productive agricultural system in history. What are your thoughts on that? I don't know if it's the most, but definitely on the top list. And that is because the people that lived here a thousand years ago had this great sensibility and combined, you know, like human ingenuity with natural power. The sun, the water, the nutrients, the minerals. In my opinion, this 
still is one of the best examples of how humans can thrive with nature, can co-create. This is the most productive system in Mesoamerica all year round. As long as you give back enough, you will have plenty of production. I knew about the Chinampas, like, whoa, the Chinampas in Mexico City, this is something I've heard about from my early studies in permaculture. But I've got to say, actually, my expectations have been surpassed. I didn't realize the extent of what the Arca Tierra project was accomplishing there. I didn't realize that they were actually already deep into integrating more contemporary ecological practices like centropic agriculture and agroforestry. I didn't realize how far into this process they were and that they'd already kind of redesigned the chinampas and created habitat and created biofilters for the water supply and had shared so deeply with so many people with their, their public relations campaigns and all of the events that they host there, connecting the population of Mexico City right into the heart of the Chinampas. So I'm super impressed with, with Lucio and with the work of Arca Tierra and also just sinking into the beauty of the Chinampas, just spending a couple days going on the boat and looking around the birds and the plants and the people. It's amazing that that exists in the heart of Mexico City. There's not a lot of other places in the world that you go the ancient system is still intact and is, is being actually improved in this way. It's all right there. It's still right there for us to learn from and experience. Everywhere we go here, we see the legacy of ancient cultures that have survived here for millennia off of the land, and we have a lot to learn from them. Mm -hmm.